Hello everyone. We have a wonderful show for you today. Philosophy Tube, they can go f themselves. We have a much better, much more in-depth critical analysis happening right here on this channel, Cyberfunkism in our cyberpunk dystopia. Thank you for joining me. People really believed in the end of history in the United States, more so than almost any other place in the world. And I taught graduate students throughout the 90s and early aughts who really um, thought that we'd moved beyond Marxism, that we'd moved beyond um, in any analysis, um, necessary class analysis, and that we were working um, just to refine ideas. And after the financial collapse, I think um, people genuinely realized that we needed to have, um, we needed to return to Marx. And that's why I think the class thing, um, um, there was a resurgence of an interest in class. There was a resurgence of interest in the notion of contradiction. I cannot tell you how many students I've taught throughout the years who told me that they know they didn't, that Freud was over, Marx was over. It was all about imminence and um imminent so the, what, ri like, the rhizome you know Benoza, Deleuze, i don't Deleuze, even want to go. yeah 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 heart negri you know stuff like that because everything was about like um flows and creativity and uh societies of um of control and uh, all that sort of bullshit 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 I think myself that identity politics is not a good thing. I think it, we are tuned to love a certain kind of identity and that's fine, but that cannot be the basis, especially if we're intellectuals, that cannot be the basis of our understanding of the world. I mean, I go, you know, Du Bois, again, at the beginning, of the, I. I'm working on him so he's on my mind all the time. At the beginning of the Dusk of Dawn, he says he apologizes, and I think that is so important. He apologizes because he can only base his remarks on his own experience. He goes ahead and does so. He says, I'm speaking from behind the veil, but he apologizes. This is so powerful. I mean, we cannot help being somewhat uh, somewhat happy about what we are. I hope, in fact, uh, I, it's a vague kind of thing, but our real effort is to go away from it so that my identity is everyone else's identity. I can't do it, but one must work as hard as possible. Reflections on race, gender, and class, which is pushing us and, and urging us to get more sophisticated and com complex way of, of understanding of this relationship beyond intersectionality. And, and also centering the question of colonialism, racism, imperialism as connected to the project of, of the capitalist accumulation globally. What you describe as Postmodern neo-Marxism, where is really the Marxist element in it? They are for equality. Sorry, where? They are for equality at these cultural st struggles, uh, proper names, how do we call each other? Do you see in them, in political correctness and so on, any genuine will of to change society? I don't see it. I think it's a hyper-moralization, hyper-moralization, which is a silent admission of a defeat. For politely saying you are an idiot, you don't know what you are talking about. Who are these postmodern egalitarian neo Marxists, and where do you see any kind even of, of Marxism? Um, uh, what's it called? Dear friends, we really need to be talking about the Ukraine or Ukraine, depending on what side of this crazy conflict you are on. But I have a much more important defense, a defense of Spivak, a very important thinker today. She is being attacked by three thinkers. So I want to say that I understand the critiques and the outrage by Chibber, Majumdar, and Catherine Liu. These three thinkers were featured on Jacobin, 
And as a pansexual, I totally have a crush on Jen Pan and her colleague, Ariella Thornhill. The worst thing, however, about the Jacobin show is that they have a paywall behind their supposed critiques of neoliberalism. <laughs> the point is not even a tangent to what we're discussing today. It's actually very integral to the problems that we're discussing today. In large part, I agree with a lot of these intentions of these three thinkers, but I think that there is a real problem of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So this is going to be a long video because I'm going to be taking on these three thinkers at once. I think that Adolf and Toure Reed have a much better, better, better analyses with regards to all these issues. But considering that I also have a very hardcore anti-institutional perspective regarding all this, because I've spent many videos critiquing the various horsemen of the Black Mirror dystopia, the Pandora's box of social capitalism opened by Gloria Steinem, Bell Hooks, Sylvia Federici, Judith Butler, and the worst one of all, Roxanne Gay, which, I do not have a single video on, but I have a couple of rants throughout my video playlist. My strongest argument being that prescribed intersectionality is integral to the logic of neoliberal colonialism, as opposed to the very imaginative capabilities that analytic intersectionality can give us. I don't have any problems with analytical intersectionality. My problems are with prescribed and enforced intersectionality. In consideration of my critiques of these people, I now feel like I need to point my fingers on the other side. The mischaracterizations coming out of the stupid poll camp. Toure and Adolf Reed are not a part of this because I love their work and I haven't found anything really problematic with them as of yet. Maybe it's because I love them so much and I'm not even looking for critiques. Maybe that's a bias on my hand. I think that the best of these three thinkers, Chibber, Majumdar, and Liu, is Catherine Liu because she is really tapping into something with her ideas about social capital spectacle of trauma, which is also a vicarious traumatization, which I will be talking about in a coming video about neoliberal sex and neoliberal love. It's going to be juicy, I promise you. Catherine's work is good, but ultimately her expertise is in fiction and film studies. And I'm so sorry, Catherine, but everyone knows that film study is filled with bird courses and that's not too difficult. Sorry, I'm sorry. Majumdar's work is interesting and heartfelt, but ultimately lacks academic rigor. And I guess my primary target here is regards to Vivek Chibber and the fact that the other two thinkers here refer to Chibber and cite Chibber for their own arrogance regarding towering figures like Spivak. Unlike Bell Hooks, Butler and Federici, Spivak is a monster, and to come up with a critique against her requires incredibly deep thought, incredibly deep exegetical work. None of these thing three thinkers do that with regards to Spivak because they don't understand her at all, so they throw out the baby with the bathwater. Catherine Liu's comments regarding Marx is explicative of this. Explicative, that's a word, right? When someone asks her if she is part of the professional managerial class, that's the main subject of her critique, which I love, it's a pretty good work, of which they ask, is she herself part of this professional managerial class? To what degree do you see yourself as a member of the professional man managerial class? I am a member of the professional managerial class. I like to think of myself as a class traitor. She explains that she is a class betrayer, that it reminds her of a critique they place against Marx, because Marx was a capitalist in some sense exploiting his own workers in his own private life, it means that we shouldn't rely or listen to him. She explains that it is possible to betray one's own class, yet she herself places this very criticism against Spivak. Very literally, I mean, Vivek Chipper goes after them in um, post-colonialism and subaltern studies, like, Gayatri Spivak is literally a Brahmin. A lot of the third world voices, third world voices who came into American academia um, from South Asia were from upper ca caste elites. Because Spivak herself is part of a professional managerial class. And it is even worse because there is an extra caste analysis because Spivak is part of the elite Brahmin caste. Yet, as a student of Spivak for many years, I can tell you that Spivak has done a lot of work, a lot of groundwork 
in rural villages, educating people more than any of these three thinkers have done, probably. This critique levied at Spivak is baseless, and it's as baseless as the attack against Marx is, or even Catherine Liu herself as being part of the so-called professional managerial class. This kind of, I'm sorry, BS is explicative of the destruction of class solidarity. Spivak should have been making a lot more money, and she could have been if she wanted to, but she didn't. Zizek, Zizek has an endorsement of Chibber's post-colonial theory and the specter of capital, which I read, but I ultimately, unfortunately, do not at all recommend. I think his newer book, The Class Matrix, is better, but I'm not sure if I can recommend that either. But I can tell you, as an advanced Zizek scholar myself, that despite Zizek's endorsement of Chibber and his own intentions, Zizek goes back and forth on the issues here quite a number of times because it is indeed a difficult issue. For this, I recommend a paper called The Sublime Absolute, Althusser, Zizek, and the Critique of Ideology, where we can see that Zizek is ambivalent on the issues proposed, where the writer named Agon Hamza proposes that Zizek becomes an Althusserian critique of Althusser, that is to say, though his critique is directed at Althusser, Zizek arrives at Althusserian conclusions. I'm not sure if I agree with Agon Hamza here. I just think that it's a good or okay explanation of the complications happening here. An alternative is that you can look at my Ritual Traces 7, the final in my series, or read my Ritual Traces work, Carrying Over the Burdens of Trace, where I offer a critique of Zizek and Hegel from the perspective of Derrida and Spivak. Zizek's inability to make up his mind on these issues is central here, and this inability to make up his mind about this philosophical issue is integral to Zizek's inability to make up his mind regarding several political positions to take as well. This is why I am a big advocate of needing a Zizek studies. Simply put, the key question here is a chicken and egg problem about whether ideology precedes structure or structure precedes ideology. Or in anthropology, the question is, does ideology precede mechanical, so-called mechanical ritual, or does mechanical ritual precede ideology? Which I think Marshall McLuhan has already given a, a perfect answer to called, we shape our tools and our tools shape us, but it is equally true that we shape our tools according to our social and economic needs and desires. And this is why I call ritual a ritual collective ideology, a ritual ideology. I don't think that we can separate or try to do a chicken and egg thing with regards to this. And you can look at my Ritual Trace Series 7 for this. McLuhan was a right-wing Catholic, much like Martin Heidegger, which I assume he was able to formulate these thoughts about the medium as the message from. So McLuhan gets a lot of his ideas from Heidegger, along with a lot of us, we get our, a lot of our ideas from Heidegger. So just as a tangent, Catherine Liu talks about Paul de Man as being a Nazi, as being central to the problems that trauma studies finds itself in today with the work of Kathy Karuk. But I mean, this controversy is nothing new. We already had the black books, which located an even worse Nazi, Heidegger. I do think that Catherine Liu has an interesting point to make about the problems with psychology, but I think she takes the wrong aim when pointing her fingers at trauma studies. Trauma studies doesn't do what psychology is doing now. And for that video, please take a look at my paranoia of the conflict of the faculties video. Maybe, I don't know if they're worse central to the formulation of a lot of present day theory. In my humble opinion, I think that there's nothing wrong with having a Nazi be a central thinker for all these ideas. Foucault, I mean, has, a, you know, has a, a history as well. And one other thing is Catherine Liu kind of throws Foucault under the bus as well, calling him, we're going to keep that aside. I think it's okay to have a Nazi as being a central thinker in, in contrast to a lot of present day thinking that says thinking in, in academia that says, oh, we shouldn't read Heidegger because he was a Nazi. This is why I think that the question of complicity is much more important 
then prescribe or enforce intersectionality because as intersectionality in practice always seems to rainbow wash the very difficult questions of incommensurability and complicity. And I sum this issue up by asking us to evoke an imagination where let's say your great, great, great grandfather is indeed necessary to your family's history of, of slavery. Imagine that. That's the difficult issue. I mean, it's even difficult to say. And this historical trauma is a much deeper issue than, for example, Paul de Man or Heidegger being theoretical basis. What about the actual physical material basis by which our family was enslaved? That is what I talk about when I say complicity is very important. On the other hand, Catherine Liu is right to talk about how it's becoming difficult to speak authentically about trauma as it is drowning in the virtue signaling world of social capitalism. Because these folks who tell us to move on, that it's not a big deal, that we should forget what's happened, or even telling us to apologize, um, these are the same tactics of abusers. Purdue Pharma to dump 300 million OxyContin pills in the state of West Virginia alone, in, in Appalachia, in the former mining areas. If the economic trauma of deindustrializing cities and towns are not worthy of mention in trauma studies, it is not simply a question of representational oversight in an academic discipline. In fact, the claim of the 2020 Routledge Companion is to be interdisciplinary. But a simple glance at economics, history, or left-wing sociology might have been a disciplinary tonic for trauma studies scholars. But the suffering of the working class is not the stuff of literary or theoretical investigation. Trauma studies wants to render PMC, the PMC both the privileged subjects of trauma with, renew, with unique recourse to experts who explain the physiological and psychological consequences of trauma on the PMC-friendly body by rendering it a part of a literary and cultural text. I understand AOC's attempt to make visible the nature of the fear she experienced in her office on January 6, 2021. I do think trauma builds upon itself. Witnessing public figures, celebrities, and politicians like AOC talk about their trauma draws us more deeply into the culture of pseudotherapy, or what Jody Dean calls communicative capitalism. Celebrities and political figures are being invited to make public their most private experiences of suffering. From Lady Gaga to Roxane Gay to Charles Blow, famous people can enhance their fame by coming out of the closet with their past experiences to become not just famous people, but survivors. What does this mean for the consuming public, the average worker, the ordinary person who cannot make ends meet? Again, a lot of these people, they say, oh, moralizing is a form of moralizing too. So the Black Mirror series was a form of virtue signaling, pointing out virtue signaling is a point of form of virtue signaling. This is the idiom that's presented to us today to uphold neoliberal capitalism and neoliberal social relationships. What is incredibly ironic here, revealing how the emperor is deciding what kinds of psychology are allowed to be institutionalized, actually have no clothes, is how this stance that pointing out virtue signaling is a form of virtue signaling is something that both prescribed intersectional gaslighting psychology of the American Psychological Association and the reductionist evolutionary psychology institutions of right-wingers actually share. Just like how true oppression in politics is found in bipartisanship between the Democrats and the Republicans, this bipartisanship in psychology is where we can find the, the discipline of psychology as a whole, regardless of how progressive or scientific it may want to present itself, is at root allied to a system enforcing neoliberal subjectivity, even when both sides are supposedly at war with one another. The inability to talk about the hardcore issues of historical collective trauma like the complicity issue I just I just mentioned, because of a prescribed intersectionality induced culture of social capitalism without trigger warnings, safe spaces motivated by vicarious traumatizations are destroying the possibility 
of speaking in the public space in which issues like this could have been addressed or discussed. The very reason why Hannah Arendt has been excommunicated from the feminist literature. Hannah Arendt tells us, who should we listen to in the public sphere? It's people who are willing to put their lives on the line. And now I think the modern day version of this is who should we listen to in the public sphere is people who are willing to put their social capital on the line. And in a way, I respect Catherine Liu and Chibber and Majumdar for putting themselves out there and putting their, but now I'm going to be attacking them because that's what the public sphere is all about. So before moving on, I will give a quick synopsis of what is, what is happening with these three, unfortunately, straw people of what is happening here, which reminds me a lot of what every side is doing these days. It's like when the right wing labels all the left under Democrats and lumps them together by calling them a bunch of communists. It's like when the left wing, the Democrats are labeling all the right wingers as flat earthers, QAnon conspiracy people, anti-maskers, anti-vaccine people, all under the same tent. America can't afford a, a, you know, a Foucauldian critique of biopolitics. What America yearns for is, bio, is biopolitics. What we, what we need is the biopolitical. And, um, and isn't it the case that Foucault profoundly overestimated the time frame in which disciplinary formations would, would give way to biopolitical ones? You know, I love reading Foucault, but how could, do we, can we afford the luxury of a Foucauldian critique of biopolitics? Isn't the thing that we need right now is biopolitics as a kind of, as a sort of basis of, of, um, of, um, of, our, um, of our society? In direct response to your, to your question, uh, biopolitics, I think, if I understand Foucault correctly, has never been about uh, an equal and fair uh, distribution of resources and possibilities. Uh, it's uh, rather about uh, the, let's say, economically reasonable uh, management of uh, what is available, right? Uh, in terms also of illnesses, epidemics, uh, but uh, it's also about the, the monitoring, the control, uh, and it doesn't mean that the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the horizon of biopolitics, it would be really naive, I think, to, to think uh, that its horizon is an equal distribution of, of uh, resources. I understand their line of argumentation. Are, you, are we aware what a horrible change of our daily rituals this is. You cannot embrace people, touch people, you cannot go on, you cannot communicate. I totally understand one anti-quarantine protester who said, no, I don't want to wear a mask, I'm no longer human, I'm like a dog, I lose my dignity and so on. So this is one option. The other option that I also don't like is the, let's call it Eric Schmidt, uh, uh, Cuomo, Bill Gates option a vision of the new digitalized space where even I will do doctor's exams through the web, food will be brought to me through, sounds like to, to, uh, to institutionalize, not necessarily in a totalitarian sense, our self-isolation so that we all will live in some kind of bubbles. My skepticism towards this, it's a well-known one, I'm not very original here, it's that uh, many of us can live like this, but a great percentage, at least 40% of the people, should nonetheless be out gathering harvest, uh, delivering food, hospitals, and so on and so on. So I don't think this works. So I will give you an example of what is happening here, which reminds me of all sides of politics, how they lump together what their own in-group sees as the other out-group. Either you are commie leftist language policing, wealth redistributing nut or a fascist hate mongering anti-masker flat earther QAnon person. Another version of this, a more sophisticated version of this on the left is conflating fascism with neoliberalism on the left and on the right calling everybody globalists, right? This is happening, as I have said before, because of the privatization of the public sphere, the privatization of information, and the moralization of the commodification of human interpersonal relationships, such that every group censors the perspective that they, they disagree with. And with this censorship comes the polarized echo chambers and the platforming of straw man positions that you disagree with. What is a straw man? 
I mean, this is basic stuff. Please Google it. Every side is engaged in this pretentiousness. The Brahmin left accusing the right of not understanding sociality and the merchant right accusing the left of being too stupid when it comes to basic economics. Now, back to Chibber and Majumdar. Firstly, Majumdar cites Chibber. Again, both Majumdar and Liu cite Chibber. What is happening with Chibber and Majumdar is something that is happening throughout scholarship today. And Chibber points it out in his post-colonial theory and the specter of capital. He explains, the most common means of doing so is to troll for the latest neologisms in order to pepper one's work with them, even if only for symbolic purposes. The result is a kind of conceptual inflation in which a substantive influence of a framework appears to extend far beyond its actual reach. That's Chibber. Now, what is funny is that Zizek endorsed Chibber, but Chomsky gives a very similar critique that Chibber is giving to Spivak. Chomsky calls Zizek a charlatan. His use of French psychoanalyst Lacan's work, and then, of course, any words on Derrida's work, uh, deconstructionism yeah. and that legacy. Well, that, what you're referring to is what's called theory. And the reason when I said I'm not interested in theory, what I meant is I'm not interested in posturing uh, using fancy terms like uh, polysyllables and uh, pretending that theory when you have no theory whatsoever. Uh, he's good, in, you know. He, he's a good actor. He uh, makes things sound exciting. Uh, but can you find any content? Now, the same critique that Chibber and Majumdar point their figure at Spivak for. Isn't that funny? I feel like I am dis deconstructing the most complex tale of leftist finger pointing and intellectual teenage drama. It's like a Spanish daytime soap opera or something. I feel like a school teacher clearing up a massive fight on the left where everyone is pointing fingers at each other. These are the days of our lives. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Okay, back to Chibber and Majumdar. Is Edward Said an essentialist? Is Spivak an essentialist? These are not essentialist thinkers. They are anti-essentialist thinkers. They are what somebody has called post-humanism, a humanism critique of humanism. What actually has happened here is that there is a whole slew of essentialist identity politic writers who oversimplify much more complex writings, who don't understand and who oversimplify. These are what I call the careerist intellectuals, people who are really good with bullshitting and people who are really good with adapting into bureaucracy and getting grant money like Kerry Burasov for 20 years. <laughs> who have a publish or die mentality. So what Chibber and Majumdar are reacting to emotionally are these same racism through the backdoor politics that I point out in my videos on prescribed intersectionality. But notice, I do not ever throw away the baby with the bathwater. And I always stand up for the imaginative capabilities of analytic intersectionality. What is prescriptive here? The power equals privilege politics that makes the truly good intention people hesitate to speak and the narcissists louder, which gradually has made the whole progressive movement into one which amplifies the most traumatized and egotistical maniacs who are willing to lie to their way to the top. The theoretical vocabulary for the self-absorption and the narcissism and the inward-looking orientation, that vocabulary came from post-structuralism. The ultimate example being Carrie Burrissaw. <laughs> and it's not just Carrie Burrissaw. She's just the one who got outed. I'm sure there's thousands of Carrie Burrissaws in our movements today. She by no means is the only one. When you deplatform people, you inevitably create a culture of platforming straw men instead. But for example, when they t tear themselves to pieces, this new young movement that I like to feel part of, it's, it's not on questions of socialism or s relationship to socialism. It's mainly on prostitution. Do we call it sex work and support sex workers unions or do we call it prostitution and ban it? And they will not allow each other on each other's platforms, you know? There's, I wanted a speaker at a conference and she wasn't allowed because she has the wrong view on prostitution. Can we afford this?
This is what the whole feminist movement is built on, a series of strategic straw men, starting with the so-called definition of feminism. Remember, when I talk about feminism, I talk specifically about the personal being political as being a, a neoliberal tool. Virtual orders, which is a breakdown of public and private and the flaunting of certain supposed private virtues as a uh, political factors. Uh, right. In this world of no more, of, of a lack of grand ambitions, grand projects, no idea of social development, let alone revolution, the PMC's private sphere and its habitus takes on ever greater importance. So uh, a large, the middle sections of uh, the middle chapters of Catherine's book are very much about, uh, you know, what the PMC eats, how it shops, how it raises its kids or its exercises, and how that's taken as public virtue rather than mere private preferences, which is what they actually are. Uh, and it's actually very difficult to have true empathy. And if you have this like constant, you know, spread of like private yeah. experience and then the expectation of pu pu public expressions of empathy, you're diminishing your capacity for private empathy and, um, you know, trivializing someone else's trauma too. And, and, and I think this is something that you see today in the in the resistance to dis, to kind of PMC discourse, which is you have to care. You have to care about this. This is this new cause that you have to yeah. care about. And it's exhausting. It's exhausting for everyone. And that's why um, oh, it's yeah. so cathartic. The far the far right and the and Reddit and all that like trolling stuff on the Internet is actually catharsis because their whole attitude is we don't care. I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. Like you're doing this. I don't care. And I have a, you know, a son who's 20 years old who's actually introduced me to like what troll troll memes are, what troll culture is, and this anti PMC, directly anti liberal. And it's like the op. So even if we have this like really insane, um, you know, enforced empathy, we have the emergence of a whole culture that's based on cruelty, sadism online, low low value cruelty yeah. isn't knobs or neoliberal order breakdown syndrome just another case of the culture of narcissism in the sense that it seems to be about a class being completely and utterly unable to imagine different material interests and cultural preferences to their own black power movement were an attempt to not only reject racism but reject a notion of integration that would deny the particularity of, let's say, black lived experience. But I think that's a very delicate balance to maintain because what you're trying to do, it seems to me, is at least tacitly come up with a new notion of universality that can encompass difference. But instead what happened was the slide into difference mm -hmm. in and of itself. And therefore, you cannot speak about Black Lives Matter because your intellect makes no difference. You're not black. I think this is deeply reactionary. So how many times have you heard the idiomatic strategy employed by feminists? Do you believe in equality between men and women? Huh? Well, then you are already a feminist. If you are responding negatively to this in dozens of ways that are possible to you, for example, with the question, are men equal to other men? The next step is to commodify emotional labor by explaining it is too much emotional labor to educate you, where in which it becomes your individual prerogative to educate yourself and not become a source of emotional labor. And that is how you become a supposed ally, when in fact, you are not being an ally to anything but the ruling classes. As I've said before, this whole line of thinking is allows the most narcissistic people to rise to positions of power in both leftist movements and abroad. It's a, it's a culture of remaining and privileging privilege. Because of a culture of deplatforming and hence platforming straw men instead, academia today is filled with straw men, filled with people who are material dependent on creating and writing straw man BS. Hence what Chibber calls inflation or intellectual inflation. So what Chibber, Liu, and Majumdar are, are reacting against are the straw men versions of so-called post-colonial thinking. The basic idea of postmodernism, post-structuralism, is that our understanding of the world is profoundly and indeed overwhelmingly, definitively shaped by discourse. That's the idea. Now that overturns the traditional, not just Marxist, but the traditional socialist commitment to what's called materialism. Now, materialism has a couple of different propositions that are central to it as well. The first is that our 
ideas about the world are in fact constrained by the structure of the world. They're not constrained by discourse. The world itself has an impact on our understanding of it. What that means is we are in fact engaging the world. We're not just engaging ideas. Discourse might even mediate our access to the world, but it doesn't shape our knowledge of the world. The world itself has an effect on our knowledge of what's true and untrue, right and wrong. Secondly, what materialists say is that on the basis of this understanding of the world, we can seek to change it. Now, here's what it comes down to for socialists, for Marxists. If you think that all knowledge claims about the world are just claims, they have no way of being tested or being, as being true or false, that they're simply just shots in the dark, that they're simply just conventions, you have absolutely no business going about trying to tell people to join in a struggle to change the world. Mm. Because it's hard and it's risky. And you're asking them to take make real sacrifices on the basis of what? Of having no knowledge whatsoever. So Marxists responded to this, the growth of post-structuralism, post-modernism, with a very critical eye, saying, if this is true, we've got to give up the game. We can't be engaged in real serious politics if discourse shapes our ideas of the world instead of our ideas of the world being shaped by the world itself. Now, as it happens, when post-structuralism comes around, Marxists are a dying breed. So it quickly displaces Marxism as the radical philosophy that academics come to. And academics, for a variety of reasons we can get into later, at the time, now we're talking about the 70s and 80s, flock to postmodernism because it provides a function for them, which they desperately need at the time, which Marxism does not. And by the 90s, it's really overtaken what used to be the reigning radical approach, which is Marxist theory. Marxism is displaced by it, and the effects of that are being felt today as well. There's millions of teachers, lawyers, feminists, activists, and so on, are repeating idioms by which they are ultimately helping the ruling classes while thinking themselves as being morally superior and progressive. Notice that none of these three thinkers do what I do, which is an in-depth exegetical analysis. If I have a problem with Butler, Bell Hooks, Federici, what do I do? I make an in-depth critique of the thinkers, page by page, section by section. But these three do not do this for feedback. The interesting thing here is that the culture of straw manning is so intense that you can see it in that clear example where Butler straw mans even Cornell West. <laughs> and that's the craziest version if you want to watch my uh, video on Butler. Un unfortunately, the sound isn't very good for that one. They do not do the hard work necessary, these three thinkers, of doing the hard work of exegetical analysis or deep thinking. Instead, they take on and are re reacting emotionally to the straw man versions of these ideologies created by a publish or perish mentality, by created by a st platforming straw man culture. So I guess they have a right to be arrogant in a sense because so much arrogance is on the side of the so-called so-called progressive movements that have been killing the possibility for class solidarity. Yeah, in, in a way, I understand them. The problem with Chibur and Majumdar is that they are putting all of the various so-called post-colonial theory, which is dead. I just said there's no post-colonial theory. There is no unified camp known as post-colonial theory. theory under the same camp. They're unifying a camp that just doesn't exist. There is no unification with post-colonial theory. I am a part of post-colonial theory. I think of myself as being part of post-colonial theory. Hashtag decolonize decolonization. To reiterate, Chibber himself notes how there is a quote, kind of conceptual in inflation in which substantive influences of a framework appears to extend far beyond its actual reach. Sorry to repeat that, it's very important. Yet. From my assessment, he is also a part of that intellectual inflation because he fails to take on the work of Spivak directly. So it means I have to ignore. I mean, Spivak's basic, one of her big grouses was I ignored her. And in her world, that's the biggest sin imaginable, if you've ever been around her. Um, there's a reason I ignored her, which is she doesn't have much to say about these things. And what she ha does have to say is... is uh, incoherent and incomprehensible. So it, it puts all the burden of reading on the reader. And I think it's strategic. I think she does it so she can always say, you haven't understood me and things like that. Before I was reminded that Vivek said this, I was going to say, well, I agree with a lot of what Vivek says. So I was trying to give him the benefit of the doubt for being angry because of how terrible toxic politics are. But he's kind of also dumb. So which is kind of insane that Spivak even gave him a gracious, pertinent answer to all his bullshitting. And he's just so obtuse that he can't actually read Spivak. We're going to be talking about that later on. 
I say this because in a 430 page book on postcolonialism, he cites Spivak three times. To simply ignore the rationale that I generated is, I think, intellectually dishonest. Then both Majumdar and Catherine Liu cite Chibber when dismissing Spivak's amazing thought provoking work by saying that she is part of the professional managerial class or that she is part of the Brahmin elite and cannot be trusted or that she is an obscurantist. Because caste in the Indian context, it's different in Northeast, it's a different in the South already in India. And so it's if you bring it into um, Southern Mississippi and if you bring it into uh, Brooklyn, it's, it's a very different scene. So that I don't think it would be correct for someone like me who works individually as well as collectively to, in fact, I'm not even interested in uh, giving a broad method because it's never followed. People say that they're following it, but even if they make policy, as I said, law is not justice. So therefore, I would, I would say this much. This is like a more complicated version of the so-called affair. With these finger-pointing maneuvers, all these people are totally subsumed within the postmodern condition. And that's basically a big problem here, is conflating, and this is a problem that Jordan Peterson has, and a lot of the right has, and a lot of the left is having too, which is conflating the postmodern condition with postmodernists, dismissing Spivak and Derrida without ever actually taking on their work. But again, this is the result of a neoliberal publisher die culture of the university. The neoliberal university, which Priyambada Gopal, Professor Gopal, talks eloquently about, and Murray Bookchin also talks about with regards to this culture as a whole in my Ritual Traces series. And we can see this because neoliberal is a word which Chibber fails to utilize in his work succinctly. Chibber goes on to critique the spread of such words like subaltern, hybridity, the fragment, and diaspora across the scholarly landscape. Those aren't even difficult words. Dude, how do you think that's hard? Go read Hegel, Heidegger, Deleuze. Of course, you fail to cite any of these works or even Derrida in your 430-page time waster of a book, unfortunately, sorry, the whole time you take on Chakrabarty, for me, Spivak is the main person that you have to attack. I know Spivak well, and if you want to have an intellectual debate about her, an intellectual fight, let's go at it. But I don't think you know Spivak or Derrida because you throw them under the bus because of Chakrabarty. The problem is that there are many people who are bad at theory and then mix up a complex post-colonial theory, which is again dead, with kinds of issues that I discussed with regards to neoliberal intersectionality and critical race theory. This becomes clear in the way that Majumdar and Jacobin quote Spivak, and then they pretty much sidestep it and make fun of it. So she writes, in subaltern studies, because of the violence of imperialist, epistemic, social, and disciplinary inscription, a project understood in essentialist terms must traffic in a radical textual practice of differences. The object of the group's investigation, in the case not even of the people as such, but of the floating buffer zone of the regional elite subaltern, is a deviation from an ideal, the people or subaltern, which is itself defined as a difference from the elite. Um, so this is pretty dense. Um, and, you know, I, as you mentioned, Spivak has a background in literary theory and deconstruction. She's clearly not the only person in these, you know, fields writing this way. Um, and, and actually, I want to say for the record, you know, I studied English in, uh, in college. And when I came across Can the Subaltern Speak for the first time, I actually kind of enjoyed like sort of looking at her like crazy language and trying to like pull it apart and, and figure out what it meant. So I don't, I'm not saying we should, you know, dismiss the text like out of hand just for being dense and jargon heavy, but you are also in the English department and you don't write this way. Your book doesn't read like this. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you see the purpose or function of this type of language being. Um, why do the post-colonial theorists write like this? Great question, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you read Heidegger, do you just pull up one paragraph and try to analyze that? Of course not. So why can you do it with regards to Derrida or Spivak? So Jen snickering here kind of broke my heart and broke my crush for her. So instead of snickering, I'm actually going to take on this paragraph 
and try to explain it even though you aren't really supposed to do that. You're not really supposed to excerpt. Jen is asking why postmodern theorists and postcolonial thinkers write like this. Well, the answer is within the question itself, and I will explain it with a couple of preambles. Firstly, the rule of non-contradiction has never actually been established within logic or philosophy. There have been many attempts at such, but nothing is definitive. Secondly, when speaking about that which is definitive, when you look up a definition of a word in a dictionary, it is generally accepted that the definition of a word cannot be self-referential. However, this linear logic comes to a screeching halt when you look up the word meaning, because the meaning of the word meaning is indeed self-referential. So the dictionary itself relies on a whole pyramid scheme with all these words being used to define other words until we get to the term meaning itself, which is premised on a circular logic. Now, this is a set theory problem, and you can read Alan Badu for that. Because of this circular logic that is problematic for language itself, it becomes excessively difficult for us to do what positivists do or love to do, and that is basically define or establish the terms of a debate before you even engage in debate. This is what Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins do, for example, when debating with theists. I would have you burned alive, but I'm a Christian, and that's, <laughs> and that's not what Jesus Christ would do. I would only do that if I was an atheist. You should be happy that I'm not an atheist because if I was, I would do horrible things to you. The problem is that how you define your parameters always already pre-establishes the outcome of a debate you are going to have. This is why atheists love to define their terms in questions about God, and this is why theists love to say that God is undefinable or outside of our understanding or outside of time altogether. To say this problem in another way, the scope of your analysis already preempts how you are going to solve the problem that you have given yourself. It's called an archival problem. Of course, you can take this too far, like with my recent critique of Silvia Federici's feminist historical revisionism. However, you can't really define a term in critical theory without, in a way, expanding your self-referential circle logic to be the widest possible. That is, for critical theory and post-colonial theory, you can totally have circular logic as long as it is wide and complex enough so as to actually be able to explain something that is outside of itself. So now we get into subaltern studies, which there have been plenty of critiques of so far, but I'm just going to take the study as is. An important side note is that the most interesting revision to the idea of can the subaltern speak has been changed to a much better formulation, can the subaltern be heard? Because obviously, the subaltern is trying to speak all the time. Now, Spivak, seeing herself as clearly within the accepted linguistic and established academic state, is here trying to point to something or some people or some identity that is outside of not just the language, but even the ability to be conceived of the logic of the Westphalian state and capitalism. In a sense, we cannot take a position from outside in terms of either this or that. My title is No Definitions for Activism, because for me, the definition of activism, since I believe that the project of democracy, I will end with democracy as aporia, which is also one of your one of your phrases, fundamental, since I was uh, looking to find how I could sound a keynote, the, you say that, the, that in Europe, uh, the uh, fundamental aporia of democracy in Europe, and I will suggest in closing, that democracy is a site of aporia. There's nothing special about Europe here. In Europe, the, spe the specialty is not an aporia. It's, an, it, it's that project of establishing a union with no sharing of power. That's a very different thing. That's a material problem. But apor the democracy is a site of ap aporia as such. But that will come at the end. It's kind of a trap to try to define it. But, you know, any reasonable, intelligent discussion of any philosophy has to start with definitions. Intelligent discussion of any philosophy has to start with definitions. Any philosophy has to start with definitions. It has to start with definitions. With definitions. The state, as Hobbes points out, is a monopoly of violence within a given domain. The state is also set with the task of defining the terms upon which its subjects can agree upon. So it's not just a monopoly on violence, it's a monopoly on language and the ability to conceive itself as well. 
through its judicial and academic and institutional structures. Something that's counter propagandistic can't have entertainment value. But it no, seems no, clear no, to me no, that it, it must yeah, have entertainment yeah, value. There yeah, must yeah. throw a romantic arc in there, throw a couple of yeah, celebrities yeah, yeah. on it, whatever. I mean, it has to be appealing to people. Otherwise, it's one of these horrible like CDC ads. Yeah, I mean, I. I, entertainment is really, really important. You know, young people aren't even really watching feature length films, though. You know, maybe well, how, could we create counter propaganda on TikTok? And TV is a popular folk art, and we have no criteria for measuring it. The measurements that we do use are just the results, bottom line. How many sales resulted from this particular ad? But that's box office. Thank you. Now someone from the audience, please. Yes. If, if the medium is the message, and it doesn't matter what we say on TV, why are we all here tonight? And why am I asking this question? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't say it didn't matter what you asked on TV. I said that the effect of TV, the message of TV, is quite independent of the program. That is, there is a huge technology involved in TV which surrounds you physically. And the effect of that huge service environment on you personally is vast. The effect of the program is incidental. Because bad theorists are mixing up post-colonial theory with cultural essentialism, so-called identity politics, and a slew of other issues, which people like Edward Said and Spivak do not do. So I think Said in part becomes at some point horrified by the effect that a book like Orientalism has had on other intellectuals and that postmodern turn that, that it allows for and, and generates. So he, he turns around and says, at, at a certain point in the night, is that he himself is not a post-colonialist. And I think that's a very important um, uh, marker because what he's trying to say here is that unlike many of the other post-colonies who were committed to post-structuralism, identity politics, etc., he himself remains a humanist and he is committed. And with that, he also shares Chomsky's position. He is committed to universalism. He's committed to a universal critique of empire. He remains an anti-imperialist. And he believes fundamentally, however problematic for him it is, in the Enlightenment project of universal values and human rights. So I think that's a, that's a key marker for Said, and that's very important to maintain. And you can see it in his work. In a sense, Said is disappointed. He, he is invested, he is born a humanist, he is a liberal humanist, and then he becomes disappointed that humanists around him and liberals around him do not have the kind of politics that allow them to support the Palestinians that he come, becomes identified with, that to pick up political causes that he becomes associated with. So he comes to see the humanists that he loves so much as being somehow complicit with empire and, and imperialism. So it's a kind of a, it's a lover of humanism that gets very disappointed with humanists rather than somebody who rejects humanism. That's Said's position. But he's fundamentally an eclectic thinker. So he is happy to have contradictory positions and he doesn't want to reconcile them. He, he says, I'm happy to be inconsistent. When he's attacked for that, he says, I don't know why people attack me for, for inconsistency. I want to be inconsistent. So, you know, he's not trying to develop a systematic or coherent, consistent theory that way. Then some people feel the need to respond to respond to the field of so-called bad post-colonial theory, which is dead. The bad. So you have to respond to the bad post-colonial theory. Or, and and we are basically throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And how do you know that they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Easy. And I will show this by pointing to the difficult questions in critical theory and post-colonial theory, not to be confused with critical race theory. They are of different origins. The conflation here of the critical race theory and critical theory is actually part and parcel to this problem as well. And by the way, saying that there is a conflation is banned too. The ban itself is banned, which is really scary to talk about. Because Chibber and Liu both fall into the pitfalls that actual critical theory, not CRT, has been trying to answer for some time. For example, but I do have one last question I want to ask you, and this is going to sound a little bit individualistic or dare I say PMC, um, but uh, part, you know, 
in in the conclusion of your book, um, you talk about kind of moving out of the PMC mindset, um, and you have mentioned that um, you know in this talk as well. So I guess my question is like for somebody who's in the PMC who wants to be a class trader, like what what are the first couple of steps? <laughs> Please write you're, it. You're you're children. Children. Wait, yeah, yeah, please, you. please do a you're children's at, book. No, I'm just you're, kidding. Yeah. You're asking me like how to, um, and I don't know that I have any answer to that. So like when you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. I don't know. When you meet the PMC within, be sure to kill the PMC within. Um, I don't know. Take an objective but compassionate view of your own feelings and put them aside. <laughs> 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 How do we account for the fact that the reactionaries actually kind of subsume the working class to an extent, i.e. the Reagan Democrats, i.e. the Nixon hard hats, and that their reactionary uh, politics, I, I don't want to say nature, their reactionary development or the phenomenon of their reactionary worldview makes them somewhat uh, unable to be appealed to by a left politics. How would you respond to that, that, that those, those, those phenomenon? Uh, when when you say their reactionary politics, you mean the working class reactionary politics? The, rea the, the working class that was particularly appealed, that appeal that was appealed to by the reactionary right, i.e. Nixon, i.e. Reagan in the early seventies. I mean, some would say even maybe Trump. It, um, I don't think it's a surprise at all, uh, Pascal. Uh, the working class wasn't made by God in the form of an angel. It's ordinary human beings who are every day being socialized and being shaped by all sorts of forces culturally. Every day being socialized and being shaped by all sorts of forces culturally. By all sorts of forces culturally. Culturally. Reactionary forces appeal to very real anxieties and very real economic needs that the working class has. So Nixon isn't just saying to them, join up with me and we'll go clobber the world or we're going to beat back the civil rights movement or we're going to capture the television stations. He's saying, Join up with me, and I'm going to give you a better life. Anytime the message of the right is made to the working class without the promise of a better life, it tends to fail. And the reason they can promise that better, better life is that they do control the main institutions of society. Now, the promise is often hollow. Now, the promise is often hollow. Let's start with Social Security. What would you do there? Uh, yeah, entitlement programs have to be reformed. Um, you know, they're going to eat our lunch. They will certainly consume our entire federal budget by the year 2035 unless we reform. I think one of the things that we need to do is really dismantle this idea that it's either race issues or class issues. Mm -hmm. We need to learn how to talk about this intersectionally. Mm. And um, it's going to take a lot of white people. Yeah. We need white people right now <laughs> to do the work. Yeah, no, <laughs> we right. need white people to organize themselves. I say that I feel like it's incredibly patronizing for you to paint these questions this way, especially as a white man. I don't expect you to be able to understand what people of color are actually saying. Oh, this import from America, gender, that's, that's, that's what's destroying that's us. That's destroying our lives. It's it's like, well, but yeah. really, but how, how do we think about that? intersection and I think we need a more textured analysis. I don't think we can go back absolutely. to this is the real oppression and all this oh, is secondary. Absolutely. It's like no no we've got we've got to have like Gramsci in mind here. You know, what's the articulation? Absolutely. How do we describe it? And the left has failed because we on the left have been unable to put forward a vision that seizes the imagination and hearts, minds, and souls of people. I agree. Unable to have institutional capacity for that vision. Yeah. That well, you deliver. do it. You're the one we look to, Cornell. You well. do it. You don't owe anybody anything. If I got paid for all of my emotional labor, I'd have, like, a lot of money. But furthermore, I want to talk about AOC and this whole theory that she has that everyone wants to date her. This is the problem I have with modern day feminism. These feminists sit there and they say that we're all equal, that we won't be treated equally, they don't want to be treated differently because they're women. And then they go and tweet things like this, like AOC said, oh, if you criticize me, it must be because you want to date me and you have sexual perversions about me. That's disgusting and that just shows you how ridiculous modern day feminism is. The Republicans' daddy issues are going to kill us all. Anytime the message of the right is made to the working class without the promise of a better life, it tends to fail. 
and I'm very skeptical of the discipline of psychology today. However, this work on this idea of cultural psychology, I'm very interested in. In many disciplines in academia, the central point about how we can understand human behavior is through the discussion of incentives. But obviously, it's the case that people continuously do things that are outside of their incentive structure that we can try to predict their behavior. And I think that here, psychology can help us answer these questions. On the other hand, I think the discipline of psychology is in a bind because it has to institutionalize ways of being. And in this institutionalization, how it goes about doing what it wants to do, the discipline of psychology itself through the American Psychological Association, through the DSM, usually ends up doing the opposite of what it wants to do. So for example, right now, there is a lot of pop psychology idioms that tell us, for example, to cut off ideas or people that do not serve us. However, in a philosophical take from a philosophical perspective, it's important to always take on the devil's advocate position. If you search up some today, the psychological position about the devil's advocate position is that in itself, it is a negative position. This clip that I'm just that I just showed is before Chibber has written his newest work. And I think that since this book was released at the start of January, of which I was waiting for before the release of that video, that interview, I think that Chibber is now beginning to notice that he has indeed hit upon a chicken or egg problem. I'm not sure if he will, and I will be waiting for his new writing to talk about his realizations regarding this, because I think he's very close in his last chapters to realize that he's just he just has a chicken and egg problem. By all sorts of forces, culturally, culturally. Through a brutal and mercilessly depleting selectivity, we will here survey the methodological problems that motivates our discussion by tracing a simultaneously ontotheological and epistemological dilemma discussed in what is called ritual studies when attempting to define ritual. Quoting Elizabeth Groats, Philosophy is about addressing the real. It is a form of ontology before it is capable of providing an epistemology. Welcome to the desert of the real. The predicament asks whether beliefs precede or follow ritual behaviors. Edward Schills, for example, assumes that beliefs could exist without rituals, but rituals cannot exist without beliefs. I pray to myself, for myself. A parallel debate exists among scholars of Confucianism with regards to the primacy of either a system of ideas in what is called Ren, or the practice of ritual propriety in the form of Li. As Herbert Fingeret finds in Confucius the secular as sacred, and reiterated in Randall Collins' The Sociology of Philosophies, Chinese thought has historically been thoroughly unconcerned with psychological or metaphysical concerns. So the classical anthropological question asks whether these beliefs are accessible from the point of view of observing researchers. But Another approach is to sharpen this question by also asking whether these beliefs are fully and consciously accessible by the practitioners themselves. Zizek notes how a Pasquillian perspective would see belief as propagated by an external, nonsensical machine. That is, just by mindlessly repeating the same gestures, if you act as if you already believe, then eventually the belief will come. While Fingeret's Confucianism would just disagree with any such mechanistic perspective of ritual, Confucian thought generally lacks any fleshed out explanation as to why. And this has a cultural reflection because in regular Chinese society, one go-to idiomatic way of talking is by saying, but tell me why I can't. No, no, there is no why. <sighs> Nothing more will I teach you today. Which means there is no why. It just is. Zizek goes on to apply this Pasquillian proposition in a much more precise manner 
by explaining how some sort of ideological or theological or social construct must have already been functioning prior to the machine-like act. Quote, When we subject ourselves to the machine of religious ritual, we already believe without knowing it. Our belief is already materialized in the external ritual. In other words, we already believe unconsciously because it is from this external character of the symbolic machine that we can explain the status of the unconscious as radically external. We can describe what precisely this mechanism is external from by referring to Stuart Hall's genealogical interpretation of this bracket western bracket subject was seen as rationally accessible to itself being a fully centered unified individual this subject was assumed to be comprehensible to itself as it is of course endowed with the capacities of reason consciousness and action as stuart hall writes the center consisted of an inner core which first emerged when the subject was born and unfolded with it while remaining essentially the same, continuous or identical with itself throughout the individual's existence. More in-depth sociological reflections would later see this enlightenment subject as being inseparable from its particular context. Through this lens, the subject would comprehend itself by projecting cultural meanings and values onto its own identity. Subjective feelings would simply align with objective social and cultural worlds, while both subjectivity and the cultural worlds they inhabit become stabilized and made reciprocally more unified and predictable. However, a plethora of paradoxes would soon present themselves when it was observed that a changing context would change this subjectivity in question. And now we'll take on the specifics of Chibber's work. Oh, hello. I didn't notice you there. This is just a message from your friendly neighborhood critical theorist. I know I spent a lot of time shooting on a lot of theorists that you love, but I also need more croissants. I hate pandering, but this is actually a lot of hard work. And I would love it if you could spend a couple seconds, like, subscribe, and share this content. Thank you for joining me in my cyberpunk dystopia. And hopefully you will continue to like the rest of the presentation I have for you. Namaste. So we start our analysis with Vivek creating a straw man for himself and then attempting to break down the straw man. The straw man formulated out of his own inability to read, his own inability to take on the difficult work at the beginning of subaltern studies, at the beginning of post-colonial theory, which starts with Spivak. The consequence of this is that frameworks such as Marxism or liberalism, which try to subsume the East and the West under the same theoretical framework, end up being deeply flawed because they fail to understand the enormous differences, empirical, historical, cultural, that separate the two parts of the world. Now, not only is this a theoretical weakness in something like Marxism, it also ends up being a political weakness and a moral one. The reason for that is that not only are these frameworks wrong in what they impute to the East, by Im imposing on the East a grid that comes out of the experience of the West, they end up also being Eurocentric, and hence suggesting not only that these parts of the world are the same as the West, which they are not, but ascribing to them cultural mores, uh, moralities, and desires which the agents do not in fact have, and in so doing, deny them those desires, those aspirations, uh, and those political ends which they in fact seek. So it, in the jargon of the field, it denies to them both their agency and their political morality. 
So what ends up coming out of post-colonial theory, therefore, is not only a different explanation, a different theory than Marxism for why the world turned out the way it did, why the East diverged from the West, but also a normative and a moral theory as to what kinds of political goals progressives and radicals should be pursuing, both in the East and in the West, in recognition of the fundamentally different psyches, the fund fundamentally different political ends that non-Western people desire. All of this, as you can see, is an expression of that underlying concept of difference, of social difference. All right, well, that's an incredibly ambitious set of claims. And if they're true, then those colonial theories are right, that it requires something like a Copernican revolution in the social sciences or in what Adam Smith called the moral sciences, which means the humanities and the social sciences put together. It requires an overhauling of the entire framework that's been handed down by the Enlightenment in the quarreling but uh, related uh, families of thought of liberalism and Marxism. So is there any virtue, any plausibility to the arguments that post-colonial theorists make? Well, it comes down to a simple set of series of questions. What are the sources of these differences? We have to also consider that in the metropolis, there is a claim by the huge um, industry of European modernism, which is also, you talked about critique of post-colonial reason, it is also claiming, in a certain sense, the entire global post-colonial. This is a phenomenon in the intellectual world in the metropolis, which then has to be taken into account. What? So the problem is not one simply of East versus West and the difference there. The problem is that a neoliberal logic is the only religion that has taken over the whole world. Within the desert of nothingness, everybody is speaking. Within that desert of nothingness, all between all of these different points of view, there's only one point of view that speaks true. So first he starts with a straw man of separating the East versus the West. Yes, maybe... 40 years ago, that's what we're talking about with regards to Edward Said. But today, we've noticed that that's not simply what it is. In the West, we have anti-capitalist rural traditions as well. When you go to a conservative neighborhood, the conservatives know well which areas of life are capitalists and which areas of life are not capitalists. The conservatives do not bring the market into the home and into the temple, for example. However, in the metropolis in the East, neoliberal psychology has invaded every aspect of our life. So this is what neoliberal colonialism is. It's a way of thinking. It's a cost-benefit analysis, which you yourself do. You see, Vivek, when you do a cost-benefit analysis in your own formulation, in your own formulation, when you do a cost-benefit analysis, when you're talking about the cost-benefit analysis of the proletariat, do you think there's any return in being in a communal sphere? Being in a communal condition, being in a communal sphere requires that you sacrifice. Democracy is inefficient. That's the problem with democracy. You need to have an inefficient religion like democracy compete against a super efficient capitalist dollar democracy. Okay, one is definitely going to win over the other if you don't have the institutional rituals. All of our institutional rituals go in one direction. It doesn't even matter if it's materialist or ideological first. We don't even need to have that conversation. Who cares? It's You're pointing your fingers at people who have realized that it's so difficult to change in the question of why do right-wing people supposedly work against their own material interests, you yourself said it's because the right has material promises. It's been 40 years. The reason why they vote for right-wing politicians is not just because of a materialist interest. If it was, then the situation would be a lot easier to deal with. You yourself said- By all sorts of forces, culturally, culturally. Do you think there's any real return of being in a communal sphere? No. The idea of being in a communal sphere requires a sacrifice, a sacrifice where the institution of psychology is just opposed to outright. When you part, let's say you had your perfect communist meeting where everyone is only talking about material 
gains. Even within that environment, we elect a union leader, and the union leader is likely to be corrupt. After all, negotiations make strange bedfellows. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Burns, but I don't go in for these backdoor shenanigans. How many corrupt union leaders are there that are corrupt just based on material motivations in the first place? And the problem is not really a material one. The problem is a psychological, ideological one. Spivak here being weary of using the word psychology because it's in a different discipline. And I'm also weary of the word psychology as well. The problem is an ideological one, not an ideological one that's separated from a material. It's not an ideological understanding that precedes materialism. It's an ideological understanding that goes hand in hand with materialism. We shape our tools and our tools shape us. Read some difficult theory, Marshall McLuhan. Read some Kant. You talk about a Copernican revolution, but you don't even know who Kant is. So it's not just a separation between East and West. It's not just a fundamental difference. It's a separation between a mindset, a communal mindset, a way of thinking that's just thinking spiritually, a way of thinking that's just completely outside, ways of thinking that are completely outside the neoliberal perspective, the neoliberal religion that has taken over, the neoliberal monotheism that has taken over every aspect of our lives. Z Vivek. Zizek. Vivek, I would love it if you were angry and well-read. Unfortunately, you're angry and not well-read. And even worse, you refuse to read. You refuse to do the hard work. You refusing to do the hard work that is outside of your ideological sphere is exactly the problem. Do you not understand that? What childish... Sorry, guys, I'm losing my shit here. Why do you have to understand it? All you have to know is that it's wrong. Why do you have to know what it, why do I have to know, why, why does Bashir have to know what it feels like to be a black man in order to know that racial oppression, what, what nonsense, what, what, what childish, sorry guys, I'm losing my shit here. How did things get to this point where in order to be able to say, I have a principled stance against a certain kind of domination, I have to have felt it? Vivek is right when he is emotionally reacting to the amount of bullshit that is being spewed throughout leftist thought or supposedly progressive ideology. A lot of traumatized people get to speak and the people who are most narcissistic are speaking the loudest. On the other hand, Vivek fails to realize the extent to which neoliberal colonialism is attacking the mind. Our very morality is under attack. Neoliberal psychology is normalizing and moralizing the idea that it's okay to treat people as a means to an end rather than an end in themselves. When you treat others as a means to an end, when our interpersonal relationships are capitalistic, when you yourself are wondering whether I should go to this communist meeting when there's going to be really no ends for me. All that there's going to be for me is just headache. As you are saying yourself, you become more individualistic. So the key here is Vivek fails to realize the extent of neoliberal colonialism. He fails to realize that our psychological institutions are reinforcing these ideas as well. It's not just and it's a whole gaslighting propaganda that starts from all of our institutions, from an academia that moralizes the commodification of interpersonal relationships to a psychology that tells you to build boundaries between us and to create interpersonal boundaries between us. This is a neoliberal psychology of the personal is political that you yourself are failing to realize how deep the issue is. All of this can be summed up in one question. When our neoliberal psychological systems tell us to let go of ideas and people that we do not agree with, that do not serve us, all this can be summed up in one question. The question is, does socialism serve me? Do my socialist beliefs serve me when I am trying to survive in a capitalist and neoliberal social capitalist cost-benefit analysis world? 
does my belief in socialism limit my ability to succeed in a capitalist world where I am implored to exploit surplus labor and to make economies of scale more efficient and in a way not care about externalities in that pursuit? You know, the reason why this has become a trope on the left that you have to, you can't take a position on something unless you understand it. It comes out of a social milieu in which everybody moves forward by claiming a, a ir, unimpeachable and irrefutable expertise on some issue. So if I'm a woman, I have a, a kind of a depth of feeling about women's issues that no man can ever have. If I'm a black person, I will be able to talk on racism with a level of certainty that a white person never can. Why are we saying that? Well, it's because now when I go to a conference or I write a paper or I teach a class, nobody who's not brown or black can challenge me. Or if in gender studies, nobody who's a woman can challenge me. It gives me a kind of leg up in the professional battle that I wouldn't otherwise have. But that just means what's promoting and propelling this is not so much a, a desire to change the world, a desire to actually overturn structures of power. It's to advance my own career ambitions. Yeah, Vivek, that's called neoliberal ideology. That's called being motivated by material interests first and foremost. <laughs> Spivak made her career in the 70s. She entered the stage by wagging her finger at French feminists for daring to talk about the Vietnamese and Vietnamese women while being themselves European. To my knowledge, this is the first time on the socialist left that somebody from the global south castigated a European for expressing solidarity and for trying to generate knowledge about the non-West. There is never a time that, that this happened before. I have born 13 children and seen most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I, ain't I a woman? Let's take the 17th century English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, mm. who basically held that our sovereignty, our personal sovereignty, mm depended more or less on getting other people out of the mm -hmm. way, on not being dependent upon other people's will. How does her thought stand in relation to his? Well, it's a wonderful contrast concept because that notion of freedom, for Hobbes literally, uh, freedom in politics is an extension of freedom to be able to move, to be able to push obstacles, including other people out of our way. For Arendt, it couldn't have been more different. We only get to be free in relation to other free people or to free others. So the notion that there is an individual who gets to be autonomous by virtue of expressing some pre-existing will, that's not freedom to her. This representation of the black body politic, which is itself a kind of racist notion that essentializes a group of people and their political aims on a on the spurious base of race, um, it flattens different interests between and within the black populations of the US um, between classes. So who are the champions of this notion of black politics and what do they stand to gain from that? The size of the black American population is just about identical to the size of the Canadian population. So, so if we pause and think for a second, well, Canadians believe X and Canadians want X, we might have a sense of how preposterous such a notion is, depending on the stereotypes that people walk around with about Canadians. I mean, I think they're gentle. Mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so, so that should tell you that there's some ideology at work here, right? Uh, right and with this notion of the black body politics. What was the traditional left, the core of left politics? It was economic redistribution. And if you're really ambitious, property relations, changing property relations, right? From capitalist to some sort of socialist ones, right? It was an attack on the market. The essence of the left was the market cannot rule our lives. What happens by the 90s is it's for more advancement within the market. Mm. You don't question the market. 
anti-discrimination politics basically says, hey, I'm as qualified as you are to get this job, but I don't, I don't get it because I'm a woman or because I'm black, and that's unfair. Real capitalists transform all social relations, revolutionize all of society. I don't even know what that means. Well, yeah, obviously you don't know what that means because that's called neoliberalism, something that's completely going over your head because you're an ability to read Foucault, okay? You don't understand what's actually going on. <laughs> and you're so arrogant about it. What that would mean is every country is supposed to look the same. Yeah, every country does look the same. Every country, all interpersonal relationships are having the same logic. That's what neoliberalism is. That's what the postmodern condition is. Welcome to the desert of the real. And finally, the argument goes. And by argument here, he means straw man. Capitalism revolutionizes all of the social relations in a particular part of the world. Real capitalism changes the culture, the ideology, the social mores, because as Marx said, all that is solid melts into air and everything, every nook and cranny of society is revolutionized. What you get in the East, however, the argument goes, is the persistence of all sorts of traditional practices, traditional beliefs, religiosity instead of secularism, superstition instead of science, backward-looking ideas instead of forward-looking. And hence, once again, the political culture, just like notions of force, just like whether or not it's consensus for consent versus coercion, the political culture remains trapped in a kind of traditional backward-looking framework. So here he is strawmanning both the West and the East. All three of these non-transformations, the argument goes, result in a political culture and in a political formation that's so different from the West that you can't call it capitalist. And because you can't call it capitalist, the categories that express the rule of capital, political economy, Marxism, they have no purchase. Not only do they have no purchase, they end up systematically obfuscating and obscuring the reality of these countries and thereby become a hindrance on political organizing and political progress. Therefore, they have to be abandoned. As Edward Said said in his own book, Marx was simply another European theorist who was no more, no more free of the prejudices of the European mind than were the people he was criticizing. What you need, therefore, is an authentic local social science coming out of the local experiences, attuned to the particularities of those locality, and which abandons universalism in favor of localism. They don't say this, but presumably every country will therefore have its own social science, its own categories, to express its own local realities. The long-term goal for Lenin and other Bolsheviks was the washing away of all borders and national differences. Nationality was seen by Marxists, especially in the early Soviet Union, as a powerful bourgeois trick. The goal of socialism was internationalism, the unification of all working-class peoples. From a perspective of national self-determination, it does not matter how noble the intentions of the internationalist ideal, the end goal was completely antithetical to the development of a national identity. The non-Russian republics, particularly those with a starkly different cultural past from Russia, were not given a full opportunity to develop and define their own proletariat. Despite genuine and often successful attempts to integrate indigenous populations into party leadership, the overarching modernization paradigm was strictly Eurocentric. Consequently, tribal relations and old social norms were dissolved to make way for a proletariat as defined by the dominant Soviet reading of Marx. Just as new classes were erected, entirely new nations were built on the basis of sweeping anthropological work. This is why Douglas Northrop employs the term inventing Uzbekistan. No such political entity or territory had existed prior to Soviet policies. Uzbekistan and many other Central Asian republics were invented by the Soviets after Turkestan was broken up into smaller territories. Though the Soviets attempted to create borders based on ethnic settlement and linguistic differences, they frequently created distinctions where there were none before. Where there was fluidity and variation, the Soviets created clearer boundaries geographically and culturally. The Soviets made nations instead of breaking them, a fact that repeatedly stood at odds with the aspiration for socialist unity. Coercive methods were also employed to proletarianize the Kazakh population. Traditional nomadic agricultural practices were forcibly transformed into collective socialist agriculture, which greatly disrupted the Kazakh way of life. 
Resisting nomadic herders sometimes responded by slaughtering their livestock, which, coupled with the unrelenting response from the state, exacerbated the significant food shortage problems and culminated in a tragic famine. By the end of the 1930s, Kazakhstan and its native population definitively entered into the industrial world. This, however, came at the expense of the nomadic lifestyle that was entirely integral to what it meant to be Kazakh. Though the Kazakh people undoubtedly crossed into modernity, they did so on largely European terms. The implication of this history should be apparent. What modern Kazakhstan gained in the solidification of a national identity and the economic transformation of its society, it lost in the opportunity to forge a unique path. As is clear from the historical studies, Kazakhstan's transformation was not entirely imposed from above by Moscow. Moreover, the social mobility and economic potential afforded by Soviet policies cannot be overstated. Nevertheless, for the Kazakh people, the notions of modernity and Russian influence are implicitly and explicitly connected. Ironically, Kazakhstan's quest for national sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis its northern neighbor is almost entirely the legacy of Soviet policies. Without a vision of socialist internationalism, Kazakh national identity will reify, not dissolve. As in many other parts of the world, national identity will be just as vulnerable to bourgeois trickery, that is, to the convenient claim that Kazakh ruling and working classes share common interests. It's actually kind of hard to blame Vivek here because Vivek is really responding to a very specific situation. He's responding to the degradation of the university and he's responding to a massive amount of straw man that exists today in a publisher die imperative. It's unfortunate, however, that Vivek doesn't realize that neoliberalism killed the West too, or at least the post-colonial theorists that they're talking about. Decolonization needs to also happen within the West for in the Western mind as well. The separation between West and East is not really the real case here. The separation is between locality and universalism. And Spivak already says so in her response to Vivek. What Spivak is trying to do, and what I'm trying to do, is to preserve whatever is left of these ideals of community that exist within these dying localities, within these dying traditions and dying languages. What we must do is protect those heterogeneous ways of thinking, because our imagination itself is under attack. What is a panacea? A panacea is a cure that applies in every condition for every type of people. The cure that you're looking for, Vivek, within the class analysis is a cure for a certain ailment, an ailment that exists from within capitalism. That's what Marx is for. Marx is a cure from within the world where everything has everything heterogeneous has become homogeneous marx is a cure for that world that's where we need universalism however for the world that hasn't been taken over yet for the dying traditions of our of our world which they still exist which what which is what spivak calls the subaltern which is what i call my village that i'm, that I'm from Within those areas, those heterogeneous areas, they haven't been fully colonized in the mind yet. Within those areas is where we can find resistance. And that's the whole point, to defend those areas. That's what the post-colonial is all about. To defend the imagination and the ways of thinking and the ways of being that comes from the very far periphery. After the French Revolution, there were several estates. There was the kingly estate, there was the nobility and the priests, and then there was the third estate, the tennis court estate, but there were also other so-called estates that weren't even estates. These are the people that live in the mountains. This is what that book, Seeing Like a State, talks about. The people who live in the far off periphery, those people who don't even have an estate, that is where imagination comes from. You don't do Marxist analysis when you go far off into the mountains in the middle of nowhere. This is why Agamben's study of oikonomia is so important. Oikonomia is this ontological understanding, is a the theological understanding of materialism. That is what is so important here. 
capitalism itself is a kind of religion. We have to analyze it as a form of religion, not just a material end. As Foucault says, the market is a site of veridiction. It's a God that returns your prayers, that gives a return on your investment. And this God is more powerful than any other God. However, monotheism hasn't taken over the whole world yet. It soon has taken over our morality, as you talked about. It's taken over our imagination, as you're also talking about. The market logic is absolutely everywhere within so-called West. It's not the West anymore. The West is dead. The West was predicated on what Hannah Arendt would call the public sphere. The public sphere is totally dead, and that's what Sela Ben Habib talks about. You say that, the, that in Europe, uh, the uh, fundamental aporia of democracy in Europe, and I will suggest in closing, that democracy is a site of aporia. There's nothing special about Europe here. In Europe, the, speci the specialty is not an aporia. It's, an, it, it's that project of establishing a union with no sharing of power. That's a very different thing. That's a material problem. But apor the democracy is a site of ap aporia as such. None of what is actually happening is unique to the European experience in some certain sense, because what the Europeans did to themselves first, then they exported to the rest of the world. And you can see this with the resurgence of the family as being a site of defense within the Christian community and how that is a straight parallel to Marxist internationalism and the creation of new ways of oppression. It happened first in Russia, then in the rest of what came to be called the Eastern Bloc. The other way was through insidious cultural subversion aimed at destroying the moral resistance of the free world and making it unable to defend itself against communism. This is what was done in the West, mainly through cultural Marxism. Another brave intervention was made by Archbishop Tomas Peta from Kazakhstan. Quoting Paul VI, he said that the smoke of Satan could be perceived even in the speeches of some Synod Fathers. These two interventions summarize our problem. Uh, one is that the, uh, the war against the family and innocent human life is uh, primarily a spiritual war. The second problem is that this war is now also taking place within the walls of the church herself. Ironically, it is the right wing that is preserving the distinction between the private and the public sphere within the West. The right wing that doesn't allow the church to become a site for the market. The right wing that doesn't allow the family, the private relationships between ourselves, the private, private interpersonal relationships to become a political matter. That is important, but what's happening is that everything is becoming marketized by the assumption that it already was marketized. The assumption that it already was marketized is actually a kind of naturalism, is a naturalism that the left has been critiquing a, a lot. This is what commodity fetishism is all about. Market relationships are natural. And it's funny that the right is the ones that are actually fighting this, the pre ayn Randian right. Now we are all ayn Randians. So before moving to the debate on post-colonial theory and the specter, we will be talking about Vivek's newest book. And what's interesting is that I don't think it was Spivak herself that responded. It's one of her uh, many students that responded, which I thought it was her, and I think that she was being too gracious to respond to such an unread person anyway. I think there are some edits here and there. The proletarianization of the far-off periphery, what is called the subaltern, destroyed the old kinship ties and the ways of being and alternative imaginations is destroying the alternative imaginations. The fact of the matter is the destruction of the family in the West has reinforced a neoliberal and individual culture instead of seeing the family as the last stand where non-capitalist imaginations were made possible. In the same way, we failed to see the interpersonal class relations in these far off periphery as being non-capitalist, but we imposed a deterministic process of proletarianization 
on those people rather than having them come to their own aporetic democratic means of governance by themselves to fight the profit motive, the surplus capitalism that is happening, instead of letting the subaltern create their own way of combating the surplus capitalism, what we did was we imposed a deterministic and Marxist analysis on the far off periphery. And that's not a West East distinction that Chibber keeps making. As I highlight in my videos, this is why there is a right wing <laughs> movement that is anti-capitalist within the West, which is mind blowing, right? The attack on the concept of love that was done by the, whole, the book, the critique of critical critique is also part of this. And I think I have to take on that book sooner or later. Love as bell hooks sees as being a site for revolution was in fact denied in a way by the Marxists themselves as being a kind of religious thing. Love was seen as an ideology in its unto itself, a non-materialist ideology, but that was almost a necessary thing. Love wasn't just an invention in Europe. Love existed elsewhere as well. So the two points are the people on the periphery are not the international proletariat, as we will discuss in Spivak's response. And number two, there are parallel stories regarding what happened in the so-called East and the so-called West. The distinction is not between East and West. The distinction is between heterogeneous ways of thinking and a homogeneous religion, a homogeneous ideology, a neoliberalism that you yourself are also unwittingly reiterating in your words. And I already tried to explain this with my comments on the union earlier in the presentation. So let's go and take a look at some of the work that you've done in your newest reiteration of your work, the class matrix. Whereas traditional theory was based on the prioritization of social structure as the fount of analysis, the argument from culture insisted that the social world was constituted by the interpretive practices of the actors who made it up. Hence, even the social and economic structures which appeared to be the concrete foundations or bony skeletons of social life were themselves products of the interpretive work of human actors. Again, you are keep falling into this chicken and egg problem. The structure depends on the agent's unpacking of a cultural script. Hence, the very existence of the structure seems to depend on the vagaries of cultural mediation. Do I have to reshow the clip where you say that there's culture involved in the right wing when they make their decisions about who to vote for? Consider the situation of wage labor. Suppose that much like the member of a church congregation, he approaches his new structure location with little knowledge of how it works. Perhaps he was of peasant origin and having been recently proletarianized, his habituate, is habituated into the values and expectations of the rural small holder. Clearly, he has to undergo some kind of cultural adjustment if he is to survive as a wage laborer. He has to understand his new vocation has a set of demands and norms that are entirely different from what he was accustomed to while working on his own land. He has to decode what it means to search for work comparing to work on his own plot. He has to accept that his employer has authority over him, that he must retain his job over time, and so on. These changes are not by any means trivial. They require the construction of an appropriate cultural stance and interpretive scheme that enables him to navigate his place in the structure. Hence. Wage labor, no less than church congregation, requires the actors to internalize the appropriate codes or else the structure will remain inert. The adoption of an appropriate meaning orientation would seem to put class structures in the same cultural construction as the church congregation. Yes, but the priority of the culture over structure needs more. The norm internalization must be a contingent affair. So now we ask if there is any reason to expect that this process of cultural education might fail. Recall that there are two avenues for failure, a breakdown in meaning and a refusal to participate. 
Now a breakdown in meaning requires that the actor fails to understand the obligations of his place in the social structure. In this case, it would entail that he cannot comprehend having been deprived of in this case, it would entail that he cannot comprehend having been deprived of every other source of income, he should seek out employment, or that having found employment, he now needs to provide his services to the person paying. He might, of course, recoil at the idea of having to do so, and I will address that shortly. The question here is not whether he resists accepting his new situation, but whether he could fail to understand it. I am not aware of any instance in modern history where a transition to capitalism was derailed or even significantly delayed by the inability of social actors to understand what wage labor meant. This is actually quite important. People may understand what labor means, but at the end of the day, there is and there can be a problem of asymmetric information. There is an understanding of them being exploited, but they don't understand the full implications of that exploitation, perhaps. What is the likelihood that he chooses to opt out as the congregation member was free to do so? So he's saying that a church person who's going to church can always opt out, but a person who is participating in the class structure cannot opt out. So in considering this question, that the distinctiveness of class structure becomes apparent. There are plenty of occasions where People cannot opt out from their religious organizations, and they have plenty of negative consequences. This is why the study of oikonomia is so important. It follows that class formation of the kind predicted by early Marxists is anything but automatic. Yeah, it happens when workers become inclined to choose collective strategies over individual ones for the pursuit of their own, of their interests. But this requires a set of circumstances only contingently available and even now poorly understood. Exactly the reason why unions break down is why critical theory and all this stuff, cultural Marxism, all that stuff started. Broadly, collective action becomes more likely when the risks and costs associated with it are reduced, when workers feel a sense of confidence in their capacity, and when they develop a sense of common purpose and mutual commitment deep enough to make their sacrifices that are inevitable in any labor struggle. But do you understand the rationality at play here? Democracy itself is inefficient. Participating in a union is inefficient. In fact, there is a cost-benefit analysis in that, and the costs, the capitalists have made that cost as high as possible because we know that unions break down so easily unions are so contingent that's part of the reason this cost benefit analysis this rationality that's why you know a lot of these cultural marxists they they blame rationality itself when we are rational about whether we should spend whether whether we should spend our emotional labor whether we should do a cost benefit analysis participating in this union or getting ahead individually guess what happens our collective well-being is always undermined by our individual interests. I run a very interesting economic game in my economics classes when I teach. One of my games is, long story short, there's an environmental world crisis, global warming crisis. The clock is counting down and the students have to, they're all in different countries and they basically have to just decide between whether their country, their country is going to be winning the capitalist game or whether they're going to be helping the global climate crisis. I've ran this about six times now and four times the global climate crisis won and the world was doomed and they all lost and two times where there was one capitalist country that basically took over everything. So when you are put into a position, when you have to do a cost benefit analysis, you're always going to end up playing a realist game. That's the problem. You're always going to choose your own individual interests over the family interests, over the collective interests. When everything is becoming a emotional labor calculation, when everything becomes a race or political correctness, social capitalism, what happens is that we lose collectively. And this is what my critiques against 
identity politics is all about as well. Sometimes capitalism itself creates the conditions that increases the ch chances of class formation. Okay, the fact that institutions enabling working class formations have to be built up and then sustained over time, the fact that they are not naturally occurring means that the con their constitution is intrinsically problematic. Yes, they are hard to build and the project of sustaining them as effective fighting organizations is even harder, which means that they are vulnerable to destruction. Mistakes are therefore very costly. A badly timed strike can destroy a union. A corrupt leadership can demoralize the members. Even the death of a leader can send an organization into decline. In sum, capitalism places the burdens of class formation entirely on the shoulders of the working class. And this is why the process is highly contingent. Employers, on the other hand, have less need to generate their own class organizations because their interests are preserved simply by the reproduction of the employment relation. I agree in many senses. I agree with what Chiver is trying to do. It seems to be a Sisyphean undertaking. That's why my problem here is that, yes, we need to help with the material so that people can be more inclined to participate in unions rather than have a survivalist mentality. But what's happened also, the other side of that coin, when everything becomes an, a material interest, everything becomes an individualistic material interest. And that, in a way, takes away from what could have been a powerful collective movement. Everybody free rides. In the early 20th century, labor was able to figure out how to take advantage of the structural and institutional facts of the time and build organizations that brought workers together as a class. They were able to shoulder the burden of class formation. But as those conditions changed, the class institutions the left had been built began to disintegrate. The class itself changed in composition so that the sectors where it was growing the fastest were those that fell outside the protection of its organizational apparatus. And yet, Chibber notices a lot of good things, and I try to say that. Chibber notices how there is a individualistic and narcissistic thing that's happened on the left, and that's basically made everybody retreat from the left and realize that capitalism is the only game in town. But that's what the whole, that's what the problem of social capitalism, Black Mirror, is all about. When you play the social capital game, people realize that capitalism is the only game in town. It's the only religion, whether you're pretending to virtue signal or whether you're actually just making money, you can pay off people. If somebody complains about emotional labor, you can just pay them off with a trip to the therapist. And psychology itself is undermining community as well in the West. So this is not a Western and Eastern divide thing. And he, unfortunately, he does that. He he both essentializes the West and the East as well. To give up on political participation and civic association, to hunker down and to try to hold on best possible, it showed up in declining voter turnouts the capitalist, uh, across the capitalist world, the erosion of party identification, a withering of civic institutions, the bowling alone phenomenon, and sundry other manifestations of ennui and cynicism. But because it was a slow accretion of discontent, expressed individually and aggregated only as a statistical phenomenon, it could go unnoticed and hence it was ignored. Yeah, we're all pointing to the same problems here. In a landmark 1987 essay, Hobbsbaum articulated what has become a sort of common sense among labor historians, that the flight of industry from urban centers followed by the migration of securely employed working class families to the suburbs had a profound effect on class identities. Whereas in earlier decades, the residential clusters and tenants surrounding the giant manufacturing hubs had tended to reinforce the sense of common status forged at work, this was no longer the case by the mid-century. As employment became dispersed and housing radiated outward and beyond city boundaries, work life and social life became even more separated. As Hobbsbaum noted, urban development, public and private, was destroying the very basis which had followed the formation of the urban villages on which so much of labor strength had rested. The effect of all this on labor movements in the great city was to deprive them of their former cohesion. If we consider these factors together, the contrast with conditions a hundred years ago is stark. 
workers' electoral status and social conditions once worked in tandem with the class structure to push workers towards a common identity. But this is no longer the case. The same distinctions of working class life have the opposite effect. They reinforce the atomizing aspects of the class structure, pulling workers apart instead of pushing them together, and hence deepening the inclination towards individualistic resistance. Whereas the social and political conditions then partially solve workers' collective action problems, today they tend to strengthen the constraints. The point here is not that obstacles to class formations have become insuperable. It is rather that the ground under labor's feet has shifted in new and unforeseen ways. Conditions that enabled organizing techniques to function in the past do not work today, or if they do, it is alongside quite novel developments that pose new challenges. Therefore, strategies of organizing that were effective in the past cannot be assumed to work today. So these are the kind of the good things about what Vivek Chibber is saying. He really tries to focus on the material. I think that although Vivek's newest book is the best rendition of what he's been trying to say, I think he ultimately fails in realizing that there is a chicken and egg problem that he keeps being arrogant about one side about, okay? We can just say that we shape our tools and the, our tools shape us. I mean, it's difficult to, that's why the study of oikonomia is so important, as I said before. So now we're gonna be taking a look at Spivak's response. Investigating the absence of internationalism in the rank and file of the labor movement and its relation to colonialism has to be foregone in a brief interview as must the pre-critical notion that capital's universalization is market dependence. Perfect. Any effort with labor worldwide immediately brings up the issue of outsourcing. There is also the gender politics within established organized labor, which encourages the cynical concept of permanent casuals. The main problem is not labor idealism, the main point is that the subaltern social groups are not the international proletariat, which Vivek just fails, it just goes over his head, because he doesn't actually read. In order for the South Asian subaltern to find an objective concept for collectivity, it is often the discourse of religion that is mobilized. There is no mere liberation theology. There is no one mere liberation theology. There are theologies. It's a hard process of taking all these particularities. And so here, how I say what I'm about to say is very difficult. It's a difficult process to change all of these particularities, to move them towards a class and towards a class consciousness. They have to come up with their own class consciousness, their own particular way towards class consciousness or whatever it is themselves. If I go in and I impose what I'm trying to do, it's when you go in and try to impose a Marxist deterministic perspective, what happens is Mao, okay? What happens is collective trauma on a mass scale. So some people might be capitalists, but they are separated from a full capitalist logic. And that is a key, the capitalist logic. That's why there is a whole attack on the concept of rationality or a rationality being a Western concept, or what Vivek talks about, how there is a whole connection to the Greeks compared. <laughs> but you see the intelligence of Spivak is she goes back to the Greeks as well. And then instead of saying that, instead of saying that democracy is a site of aporia, she says that aporia is a site of democracy. It's incredibly intelligent what Spivak is doing here. Spivak is not only doing the hard work of decolonizing the East, the East. She's also doing the hard work of decolonizing the West. Chibber takes his model of post-colonialism from an upwardly class mobile or professional second generation of immigrants in the US who do speak of the East and the non-West and may sometimes imply cultural equals psychology, legitimizing by reversal. So this is the professional managerial class that we're talking about. I would like to mention Kathleen Collins and her excellent book, The Clan Politics and Regime Transition in Central Asia. She does not consult Gramsci, 
but her intellectual curiosity and disciplinary acumen permit her to rediscover that southern Italy has a conjecture comparable, of course not identical, to Central Asia, a mixture of capitalist and pre-capitalist ideological formations, separating proletarian and subaltern. Chibber, ignoring this type of possibility, takes the subaltern as a synonym for proletarian and offers the usual mechanical Marxist utopian pronouncement. Now here is a really difficult point to make because Adrian Johnston, because usually I come down in the West, I come down on the Marxist determinist end of the spectrum with regards to this accusation of Marxist determinism. However, in this sense, we have to realize what Adrian Johnston says, which he says, it's not that the Marx, so-called Marxist determinists that are reducing everything heterogeneous into a homogeneous logic. It's the capitalist system itself that makes everything homogeneous. Yes, everything is becoming homogeneous. However, there are places in the world where people are still aligned to their kinship values. People have other values. The homogeneous religion has not taken over the whole world. Those places in Africa, as we just read with Silvia Federici's work, it's in Silvia Federici's work that she talks about, in Latin America, in Central Asia, these places, people have allegiances that are more important than capitalism. What do we want to do here? Make those allegiances, those non-capitalist, non-rational, non-rational even, considerations, those religious theological allegiances, those kinship ties, do we want to erase that like how the Soviet Union did with regards to many of their peripheral people? No, that's a form of colonialism. That is a that form of proletarianization of the mountainous people doesn't help. We need to go to the mountain and learn from the mountainous people. We need to go learn from the indigenous tribes. That's why I don't throw out the baby with the bathwater when it comes to intersectionality. I think that the so-called intersectionality is important, but we have to learn from the last remaining non-capitalist, anti-capitalist, a-rational, a-capitalist, heterogeneous ideologies that exist within the pockets of our civilizations. We need to protect those. We need to help indigenous land rights, for example. But instead, what we've been doing in, in the Canadian context, we've been engaging in a kind of neoliberal, neocolonialism, where we enforce a certain progressive rhetoric so that we have people like Carrie Burrisaw who are engaging in their own ideal of academic colonialism within the indigenous communities here in Canada. And this kind of thing happens all over. It is on this level of generality. This is the problem with Chibber is generality. That Chibber insists that what produces a connection between the subaltern classes, according to his definition all over the world, is the something like physical well-being or materialist interests. There is no grand narrative of so-called physical well-being, or it is so grand that it is otherwise inaccessible to the subject. That is Levinas's argument. Levinas is really important. The moment you go from body to mind, from physical well-being to fighting for physical well-being, there is language, history, and permissible narratives. For example, the mother who thinks honor is important and the daughter who thinks reproductive rights is important. What happened in between? Indeed, there is no point in Marx's exhortion to his implied readership in Capital Volume 1 to change their self-conception from victim of the capitalist to agent of production. That's a entrepreneurial bullshit neoliberalism. The subaltern is not an agent of capitalist reproduction or production. And what's really interesting here is Vivek doesn't have much to say about feminism and he's quiet about that in a lot of senses. So that's a reveal. Now we get to one of Chibber's worst arguments. The idea that democratic culture derives from the beneficence of capitalists 
is central to Guha's work. I'm not talking about Guha's work or all these other people that they're talking about, the Indian context. What's important to me is that this is such a straw man, that Chibber associates post-colonialism with this Amartya Sen kind of capitalism, where capitalism and democracy are supposed to be allied to one another. Nobody agrees with this. Everyone knows that China has been a total counter argument to the Amartya Sen line of thinking, where you can have an incredibly totalitarian form of capitalism that is even more efficient than the French or English forms of liberal democracy capitalism. And even Raymond Goyce talks about this as well. Raymond Goyce talks about how these ideals within capitalism are incoherent with one another. To begin with, the passage is problematic because bourgeoisie and capitalists are used as synonyms. Guha actually quotes a cluster of passages from Gandhi in Domination Without Hegemony, claiming that his theories of corporate social responsibility were to fight socialism. This corporate social responsibility, Amartya Sen capitalism. Professor Chibber, in spite of the good motive to clean the house of poor theorizing, cannot, to quote my old friend Shannon, understand that socialism is about justice, not development. And here, our generation understood so-called development as exploitation. And we talked about that. If you're interested, go look at my critique of Silvia Federici, where she talks about how a lot of these modes of development, all these forces of development were actually another form of neoliberal colonialism. So again, we're talking about more Indian context thinkers that I'm not really familiar with, but that's not really the point. Chatterjee simply denies that so many nationalist leaders saw as self-evident whatever else the post-colonial state did. It would have to find a way to develop the local productive forces. Is this what Verso wants to propose as a socialist solution, mindful of classes in globality? So now Spivak points her fingers at the publisher. Verso Books, that's crazy. That's awesome. And I'm pointing my finger to Jacobin right now as well. Usually, again, I'm on the side of so-called Marxist determinists, but not when it comes to this. Not when they come. Not when it comes to the throwing out the baby with the bathwater of all post-colonial, so-called postmodern studies, making that Jordan Peterson argument. Where are these postmodernists? Um, uh, what's it called? In order for the capitalist to progress. Labor must be put in the form of value, contentless, says Marx, so that calculations can be made. It is as simple as that. Calculative thinking. Chibber seems not to have grasped this at all and ignores the ins and outs of so-called reification debates, which are now going completely in the direction of liberal humanism in the work of Axel Honneth and others. Honneth's recent Tanner lecture simply puts the critique of reification in the classless identitarian area of recognition, which reflects a tendency much more insidious than anything the efforts of the subalternists might signal. But Chibber is located in the tendency among Little Britain Marxists patronized by the now defunct British left, which produces periodically peculiar texts demolishing any attempt at expanding the scope of a general Marxist discourse, something like a broad left now innovated in Greece facing the depredations of the Eurozone, internal colonialism, if you like, into the interplay of capital and colony. Internal colonialism, that's what I'm saying the whole time. They colonize themselves first. Chibber accuses the subalternists of romantic orientalism. To bring together the subaltern and the proletarian, both seen as riddled with prejudices, was the last piece of writing that Gramsci was engaged in when he was nabbed by the fascists. Acknowledging that the general strike of 1920 had not worked, he was now looking at the possibility of making long-term change. The subaltern social groups, by definitions, are not unified and cannot unite until they are able to become a so-called state. Their history, therefore, is intertwined with that of civil society. An extended discussion would have to consider 
Gramsci's special understanding of so-called civil society, and thereby the history of states and groups of states. Hence, it is necessary to study, one, the objective formation of the subaltern social groups by the development and transformations occurring in the sphere of economic production, their quantitative diffusion and their origins in pre-existing social groups whose mentality, ideology, and aims they conserve for a time, their active or passive adherence to the dominant political formations, their attempts to influence the programs of these formations in order to press claims of their own and the consequences of these attempts in determining processes of decomposition, renovation, or neo-formation, the birth of new parties of the dominant groups intended to conserve the ascent of the subaltern groups and to maintain control over them, the formations which the subaltern groups themselves produce in order to press claims of restricted and partial character, those new formations which assert the autonomy of the subaltern groups, but within the old framework, those formations assert the integral autonomy, etc. What's important here is I, what Spivak is trying to do is basically destroy this East-West distinction and saying that there are similar parallel forces happening within both, and both of these are essentializations. And even though the the queen of subaltern studies is saying this, we will see again that Vivek fails to read. Chibber, ready to tilt at the subalternists and unaware of Gramsci's distinction between subaltern and proletarian, produced the universalist romantic utopian leftist narrative that I have cited above. Chibber's sentence, there was simply no way to accommodate subaltern demands for improvement in their living standard while keeping domestic capitalists on board except through a modernizing agenda, shows no awareness of the subaltern social group's distance from the state. So now we get to the real so-called controversy he at play here, where Spivak points her finger at Chibber and saying, like a mo good mother should, this is a disciplinary problem, an inability to read philosophical writing that is also political and diagnosing it as nonsense. There are fields that, again, the subalternists assume to be part of a familiar background of all kinds of actors attempting to rethink a left that was moving more and more towards totalitarianism. Had Chibber tried to look at India in deeper focus, he would have now seen how absurd it is not to acknowledge the obvious differences between Britain and France, taken as so-called Europe, the essentialization of the West, and the huge multilingual, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious reality of the Indian subcontinent in the 19th and 20th century. This is not a critique of Eurocentricism. It's not. Eurocentricism isn't even a part of post-colonial thinking in a way. There's much bigger issues at play than Europe. Europe has its own problems now. Europe is a small land now. It is Chibber that keeps bringing back us into Europe. We don't need to go back to Europe. And here I was trying to find some videos where I've seen Spivak do interviews with the so-called subaltern in these Indian villages. But I'm sure because of the way Spivak is, those videos have been deemed politically incorrect. And in a way they've been, um, and I think that that's the reason why they're so hard to find because Spivak's videos are deemed politically incorrect. But it's so stupid, the whole left. Yes, we need to cut off this extra fat that Chibber is trying to do, but Chibber is failing to do it. Because, and we can see one way he fails to do it is he takes no position on feminism. In the elementary schools of the rural landless, where Spivak has trained students and teachers to learn and teach from the state curriculum for nearly three decades, now she tries to make her groups friendly with the wretched map of the world on the back cover of the geography book. She reminds herself not to be a so-called improver and discusses with her increasingly more aware co-workers 
the teachers, from the community, the fact that she is not drawing profits from the work for and with them. Although they are not well ac acquainted with the world map and know nothing about colonialism, they have and have not seen any factories of any significant size, they do not, they do, they do understand what profit or munafa is. Exploitation of surplus labor. They are subaltern. They have no special psychological essence. They are not the East or the non-West. Europe is part of a much larger world now. And here we talk about, and this is why I talk about China so much, right? Marriage, the marriage of socialism and capitalism, where the turnover rates are 10 times higher, where the rules are much different from what the Professor Chibber's Bautades about capitalism and capital equated. Yet, uniformi yet uniformization and universalization is raring to break through. And she's obviously talking about, and she's obviously talking about China here and how Chipper is still talking about Amartya Sen ideas when Amartya Sen has been totally... Uh... And now, citing a passage where Chakrabarty is clearly paraphrasing Walter Benjamin's notion of now time. I think this is messianic time. Chipper asks the rhetorical question, is this passage meant to explain anything at all? Messianic time is so important. Let us look at Benjamin's powerful articulation. The past can be seized only as an image which flashes up at the instant of recognizability, never to be seen again. History is the object of construction, whose sight forms not with homogeneous empty time, but time filled with the now time. The meta-narrative Chakrabarty is speaking of contains the relatively autonomous field of politics, ideology, and the economic in a structural fit. In his earlier work as well, he is speaking of the strong hold of an older ideology, residual on the Raymond Williams model, rather than a unique psychological disposition of Indians. All Indians? This is a result of a problem of reading. We want to close with a reference to feminism, of which there is no mention here at all. Some of us have argued for a rather long time that feminist movements had an oblique relationship with the tradition of imperialism, where the nature of this relationship is not recognized. It is precisely the subaltern women who is ignored. The lower classes are also ignored. I was visited two days ago by a young Indian American woman wanting to make a film about the rape of Jyoti Singh by consulting experts like Noam Chomsky, Sudhi Kakar, and Spivak. I was not able to rise to her request because I felt that this was not a productive enterprise. In the process, since she was also using the fact that the idea came to her through her son's sex education class in the Midwest of America. I tried to tell her about the use made by men on the left, so-called of women who believe in the enlightenment, just exactly as use is made of women who believe in anti-feminist traditions. I told her that the general sympathy for mother-son discourse, family values, and women who still make use of it would be diagnosed by the most relentlessly honest philosopher of the Enlightenment as keeping women enclosed within an absence of civil personality, with tradesmen, servants, minors. I told her we must learn to disprove this. I must repeat this at the end of my review because there must be a feminist consideration of Chibber's emphasis on the heroism of the subaltern classes misunderstood as simply part of the world's disenfranchised existing within the same history as Europe, supporting his desire to dismiss subaltern studies as part of post-colonial studies. That desire I should have liked to contest in terms of my own conflictual but instructed experience with this group, but since I have no foothold in this book except as an object of mockery, I think that would be, to quote the language understood by Chipper and his cohorts, bad form. I'm going to end with this just to say I read the whole thing and it's kind of sad because 
Chibber just repeats himself. It's like he didn't even read this response. I chose to focus on these areas because my interest was in what post-colonial scholarship has to say about the social structure of politics and historical evolution of the global south. Since its claims about these phenomena are considerable interests and they have been extremely influential across the academic universe. Okay, it has generated a core set of arguments that can be taken as a set theory and research program. And then he goes on and he repeats the same arguments that he made. An insistence on locating the specificity of the East and on examining how and why its evolution differs from the West. And when I read this, I said, didn't you read? The response to this spent a good amount of time destroying the notion of the West itself as well as the East. But you just reiterated a essentialized West and an essentialized East as well. Okay, maybe there is a good portion of of work that is essentializing, but that's no reason to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Rather than just asserting that there is an ontological divide of some kind dividing East and from West, they try to provide real historical arguments for its plausibility. Vivek, I'm from a small village, and I can tell you that there is no East-West divide, of course. I can't speak on behalf of the whole West. All I can speak about is the ontology of my village, the ontology of this neoliberal religion that after having traveled across the world, after having been to 50 countries, after seeing malls, the same mall, the same airport, the same logic of capitalism, the same neoliberal progressivism, and the same fascistic response to this neoliberal progressivism happening all across the world. There is one world religion that is enforcing itself. And I'm coming to you, I'm talking to you from I'm talking to you as a so-called native informant. I'm talking to you as an educated villager. I'm saying to you right now that we need to preserve those languages, those ontologies, those folk structures, and not conform everything into a modernization, a Maoist kind of modernization. I've been to the mountains of China and I've seen the villagers there and how they are being forced out of their traditional ways of living right now so that they can conform to this proletarian, so-called proletarian structure in China, which is actually just another form of Marxist neoliberalism, as my other video talks about. So thank you for taking the time to listen. This was a very difficult video to do, in, in honesty. I went into reading Chibber because I wanted to bolster my arguments against this prescribed intersectionality perspectives that you can see in my videos talking about how prescribed intersectionality is detrimental to a lot of what we are trying to do in terms of building solidarity. What I found in Chibber instead was a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of failure to read and a lot of failure to read well. So this was my video kind of fighting back against this kind of stupid poll. And this is what I call the stupid, stupid poll. I thought of myself as being on the stupid poll end of the spectrum these days, but I'm still defending the woke in some sense. I feel like I'm stuck in between this intense, stupid woke and an intense, stupid, stupid poll. A stupid, a stupid, stupid identity politics on the right and a stupid identity politics on the left. And again, I'm going to go back to the biggest issue here, which is the moralization of the commodification of emotions and our interpersonal relationships, which has, in a way, destroyed our ability to read. It has destroyed our ability to mm, share platforms with people that we disagree with. And because of this, there's all of these miscommunications happening. And I hope, just like Sartre's miscommunication of Heidegger or 
all of these miscommunications in the past that gave us better work. I hope that we can find a way out of this by building some collective rituals where we can all come together and once again point our fingers at the real colonialist, imperialist, capitalist 1% that is right now avoiding taxes through the Panama Papers. The There's like a huge void of global currency that is unaccounted for because of the global 1%. And that 1% Panama Papers includes everyone from Xi Jinping in China and the Chinese 1% in, in cahoots with the Western 1% as well. So the tankies are a problem as well. Man, that was really difficult because there were so many thinkers who were just in that and everybody is fighting each other and there's just no shared and the problem is just and the main problem again is that there is no shared platform anymore which is really detrimental to building solidarity <laughs> اولین ترانه ای که من با اون کار فولکلور شروع کردم و خواهش کنم اینقدر به فارسی نچسبید فارسی دوست بدارید تو زبان ملی همه اما زمان مادری داریم هیچ قومی فکر نکنم از خوزوان و مادری فرار بکنه چرا ما کار کنیم؟ من چند بار آیم گیلان ایسا غصه هم برای بگردم می گیله کل دینم جوانان به مخصوص آو همه با هم دیگه بارتی گفتن نده چه اصراری داریم؟ نه همه زبان ها تنیم پنجا تا ست تا تمام زبان های عالم ها بدنیم اون سر جاش در جای خودش زبان مادری اما یه چیز دیگره می مار می گواری وقتی تکنده این گیلی جی مره خنده هست من دیگران مارم هستو چه اصراری دارینی که فارسی گفت بزنی اما اون چی که امید دیلی میان نه اونا فارسی بگی نه مخالف هم و از شما خواهش کنم Zahmet bekeşi Mitchell Cheron